Now we look at the second reading. Uh, we're, we're in this section uh, where the liturgy is reading through Hebrews, and we have now uh, Hebrews 12, 1 to 4, and it's interesting because it fits perfectly with this theme of uh, uh, believing in adversity, or however I've framed it before, but you know that's what I'm talking about. What do I call that? Well, I can't find it right now, but it's, you know, preaching or or helping in adversity. Okay. Now, he's just finished chapter 11, all the witnesses of faith, okay? And um, so he concludes um, that that chapter... um, and I want to read that concluding because our text picks up right after that conclusion. Uh, chapter 11 of Hebrews ends and then uh, you see chapter 11 let all these yet all these though approved because of their faith did not receive what had been promised. God had foreseen something better for us, so that without us, they should not be made perfect. And that word perfect there is rather important, but we don't have time right now to go into it. Uh, they shouldn't be, well, their part of the meaning is ready for eternal life. Then, starting with chapter 12, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses. Now, who are these witnesses? Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, um, the Maccabees, you see. These are all our ancestors in the Old Covenant. But that Old Covenant was a real covenant. And they are our forefathers. And that's why he says we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses. Then let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangled. So, uh, and persevere in running the race marked out for us. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith. Okay? The Archigon and the Teleotin. The uh, Archigon, uh, the leader. I wonder how this... Uh, the leader and perfecter of faith. Yeah, that's all right. Um, I should have put my own translation down here, but it's okay. Uh, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, hanging there naked, naked, everybody laughing at you, your hands and feet nailed to this wood. That's shame. And he scorns it. Why? For the joy set before him. Well, what is the joy set before him? We are. Those of us who believe in him and try to obey him and whom he is looking forward to be with for all eternity. That's the joy. Now we can ask ourselves, am I always a joy to Jesus? And, uh, you know, the answer is probably not a lot of the time or some of, some of the time we're not. And what this text is telling us, obey him, trust him, and let him be a friend to you, your life will change. You know, St. Teresa of Avila was sick, so she was traveling, but she was traveling in the back of a donkey cart instead of, you know, walking or being on the donkey. And uh, he went, the little donkey with the cart went through a brook, and the thing tipped the cart and she kaplunk fell right in the water and so she gets up she's soaking wet you know and the lord is standing there and he says uh, well that's the way i treat my friends she said well there's no wonder you have so few of them but if we want to be his friend you see it's for the joy of being with us forever that he just despised the pain the shame the abandonment of the cross He despised all that because he was so anxious to be with us for all eternity. 
Can you think of that? Now, are we that anxious to be with him? You see, that um, for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. In your struggle against sin, you have not resisted to the point of shedding your blood. It might come to that, but you haven't. But you've got to resist sin, not just your own, but the way this whole text started, you see, the relativism of uh, denying that there is an objective truth. And people who are so intolerant as to think that you can judge right and wrong, you see, those are the ones who are causing us all this trouble. That's us. Just, if you want to hold your little Christianity and just keep it in a corner and, and console yourself, that's fine. But once you say that you're not going to pay for abortions, all of a sudden, you see, you're disrupting the country. And who the heck are you? You see? And so, uh, that's why he says, um, let us, let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author, author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. We have to pray that if things get that bad, we, like Jesus, will scorn the suffering, looking forward to being with him forever. We have to know how to do that. Well, by ourselves, we don't have the, the wherewithal. But if we practice now yielding to the Holy Spirit, confronting darkness, speaking the truth in love, you see, if it ever happens, we will be ready to be sustained by the Holy Spirit uh, and live in prison or be killed or whatever, if it comes to that. Um, you see... Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. In your struggle against sin, not only your own personal sin, but the sin around you and the relativism and all the things we've been just talking about, you see, and all those remarks that John Paul II made, you see, totalitarianism arises out of a denial of truth in the objective sense. If you want to hold that, go ahead, but don't bother the rest of us with it. You see, if you think abortion is wrong, all right, don't have one. But don't walk up and down the street telling everybody else it's wrong. It's none of your business. But if there's an objective truth, it is my business. First, to save that child from being murdered and to save that woman from living with the memory of an abortion the rest of her life. I remember once... I was talking to a woman, brilliant, you know, bright, bright red hair. She, we were talking in, in Washington here, but we were talking, and she was getting ready, studying to be a civil rights lawyer. I may have told this story before, but she had the foulest mouth of anybody I've ever heard. And I worked in the Merchant Marine. Uh, anger and just foul mouth. This is going on and on and on against the... All sorts of things. She's going to be a political activist and a civil rights lawyer. And about midnight, all of a sudden, she just stopped. Said, I've had an abortion. And then I saw the root of all the anger that she's trying to direct toward justice, quote unquote, instead of letting the Lord justice forgive her and give her peace. So we prayed for a while. I never saw her again. I don't know how she did. But it was so interesting to me to see this woman, 30-something, I would guess, a lawyer, or studying to be a lawyer, civil rights, get into there with civil rights, angry, 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 and with, as I say, with a mouth. You know, I never heard that bad in the Merchant Marine. Uh, but it was all driven by this weight of abortion. Okay. In your own struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. But it might come to that. You see, that's the, uh, the thing he's telling us. So, look at the great cloud of witnesses. You see, this is chapter 12, 1 to 4. We've just finished chapter 11, 
all the witnesses of faith. And they were, as the text says, um, um, what more shall I say? I have not time to tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, and Samuel and the prophets, who by faith, the prophets and all the rest, conquered kingdoms, did what was righteous, obtained the promises, they closed the mouth of lions, put out raging fires, escaped the devouring sword. Out of weakness they were made powerful, became strong in battle, and turned back foreign invaders. Women received back their dead through resurrection and so forth. And so then, with all that cloud of witnesses, you see, and that's how we start the next, you just learn through this whole list of them. And if you look at any Bible, there'll be footnotes telling you all the people he's referring to. Uh, since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of Old Testament witnesses, besides all the martyrs, Christian martyrs, you see, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith. You see? Um, um, I'm looking for that. Anyway, uh, that's what we're being exhorted to. Fix your eyes on Jesus. And he will be there when you need him. Whether it be very serious or mildly serious, uh, you see, uh, we're going to be living with a certain amount of adversity as others try to impose uh, a very particular philosophy on us, which we can't accept. And we must continue to, uh, you know, protest abortion and so forth. And uh, that doesn't make us popular with um, a lot of people. Though, when they change, where do they go? They have to come to us. Nobody else is going to embrace them and help them get over the fear, the guilt, the shame, whatever, the anger. And so, this is what this text is telling us. Um, and that's part of this living with adversity. You see? Uh, and so that's uh, as far as we go with that. Um, and now we'll start uh, the next part.